Um, we're going to talk quickly about the role of radiation in the management of pancreatic cancer. Um, first, as we all know, pancreatic cancer is characterized by a high rate of distant metastatic disease. So you might ask, is there even a role for local therapy with radiation, and where does it fit into the treatment paradigm? So we're going to quickly review um, the evolving role of radiation um, in the setting of resectable disease, borderline resectable disease, and locally advanced unresectable disease, and then focus actually mostly on technological advances such as stereotactic radiation that Dr. Lacey was just talking about, and how this might improve outcomes through the ability to escalate dose delivered to the tumor. Um, so for resectable disease, there's really only the minority of patients who present with disease that can be surgically removed at diagnosis. We know that post-op chemo is standard of care for these patients. And so the question remains, is there a role for post-op radiation uh, after surgery? The data so far has been conflicting. This is just an early Gitzig study, just 40 patients showing a benefit to chemo radiation in the adjuvant setting, but that was compared to surgery alone, and really used chemotherapy and radiation techniques that we would consider now to be outdated. Um, the only randomized study that has looked at adjuvant chemotherapy versus chemoradiation is this SPAC-1 trial. Um, and on the chemotherapy arms, there was a survival benefit, but actually a detriment on the chemoradiation arms. Um, there are many methodological flaws of this study that we won't go into, but really that's called into question, is chemoradiation really detrimental for these patients? Um, we did do an analysis of the uh, National Cancer Database, looking at over 6,000 patients who had resected pancreatic cancer, and asked, uh, is there a benefit to chemoradiation compared to chemo alone in the adjuvant setting, um, and did see a benefit um, on multivariate analysis and propensity score matching. So the study that's accruing now nationally is the R2G0848 study. It's been changed several times, but right now patients are receiving gemcitabine alone or uh, combination chemotherapy, gemzolota, fulfirinox, gemabraxane for five months. Um, and in those patients with no progression, um, they're being randomized to an additional month of chemotherapy or one month of chemotherapy followed by chemoradiation with zolota, uh, concurrent zolota or 5-FU. So I think hopefully we get answers from this study. Is there a role for postoperative chemoradiation in the setting of modern systemic regimens and modern radiation techniques? There was one um, s series from Johns Hopkins looking at rates of local uh, recurrence, and they actually mapped where these recurrences were and found that the majority of them are in this small region around the celiac artery and the SMA. So currently, our standard fields encompass um, quite a large field where the, the tumor bed, where it was located, as well as the regional lymph nodes. But this would suggest that perhaps the area at risk for recurrence is a lot smaller than what we're currently targeting. And with a smaller treatment volume, we could improve tolerability of treatment and also perhaps uh, improve the uh, efficacy of treatment through possibilities for dose escalation and maybe even utilizing SBRT. So in conclusion for resectable disease, we know that adjuvant chemo improves overall survival and is still our standard of care. We have an ongoing RTOG study evaluating the role of chemoradiation in the context of modern systemic uh, chemotherapy. There's a possibility for reducing the treatment volume if we do utilize radiation, and perhaps that will improve tolerability and might um, improve efficacy. And then finally, current studies are also looking at the role of, um, as Dr. Lacey mentioned, chemotherapy and or radiation in the neoadjuvant setting. Perhaps that's more efficacious by controlling micrometastatic disease up front or improving rates of R0 resection. Um, for patients with borderline resectable disease, um, as we heard, uh, the, the rate of positive margins with an upfront resection is increased because of the proximity of the tumor to the vasculature. Um, and we know that survival after a margin positive resection is really comparable to survival um, in patients who haven't had surgery. Um, so several studies have evaluated the role of neoadjuvant therapy for these patients. Um, there's a largest series from MD Anderson of about 160 patients with borderline resectable disease. They were treated with preoperative gemcitabine-based chemotherapy followed by chemoradiation, and about 40% of them were able to undergo resection, um, with uh, R0 resection received in, or achieved in nearly all of those patients. And as you would expect, the median survival was a lot better in the patients who had surgery compared to those who weren't able to have surgery. Uh, more recently, there was a small um, single-arm alliance trial that looked at more modern chemotherapy, so four cycles of fulferinox followed by fractionated chemoradiation and concurrent zolota. Um, the resection rate was nearly 70% in these patients, and essentially all of them had margin negative resections. In five patients of the 20-some that they had analyzed, there was less than 5% residual tumor at the time of surgery, and PATH CR um, in two of the patients. Um, so these studies suggest that there's a benefit to neoadjuvant chemotherapy plus or minus radiation. 
um, in the neoadjuvant setting, and there's um, currently a randomized alliance trial that's looking at um, neoadjuvant chemo randomized to plus or minus radiation um, currently accruing. And then for the majority of patients that we do um, see for treatment, um, those with locally advanced unresectable disease, we again have conflicting data as to whether there's a benefit for chemoradiation or radiation um, in these patients. Um, a more modern ECOG study did show a benefit to uh, chemoradiation with gemcitabine compared to gemcitabine alone, but a pretty small benefit with median survival of 11 months compared to 9 months. Um, then there were subsequent um, uh, retrospective and phase two studies that looked at um, whether there's more of a benefit to chemoradiation in the population of patients who have not developed distant metastatic disease after initial chemotherapy. So shown here is one such study, a, a combined analysis of patients who had approximately three months of chemotherapy. And in those patients, about 30% developed metastatic disease. And those that did not, we see uh, more of a prolonged survival benefit if you go on to chemoradiation versus continuing chemotherapy. Uh, so this treatment paradigm was uh, evaluated in the randomized LAPO7 trial that we just heard about. Um, and this was a randomized trial looking at induction chemotherapy, four months of gemcitabine or gemcitabine with erlotinib. Patients without progression were then randomized to continue chemo chemotherapy uh, or receive fractionated chemoradiation um, with concurrent kepcitabine. And interestingly, uh, the, the promising survival results from the retrospective or phase two studies were, were not seen in the randomized setting. We, there was no overall, survive, uh, overall survival benefit uh, to chemoradiation after four months of induction chemotherapy. Um, but, however, there was a local control benefit with chemoradiation. Local regional progression was 46% in the chemotherapy arms versus 32% with chemoradiation, and also a prolonged treatment-free interval with the use of chemoradiation. So despite those negative survival uh, uh, results from the LAPO7 trial, why do we still see a great percentage of our patients with locally advanced disease um, receiving uh, chemoradiation or uh, radiation after chemotherapy? So I think several reasons. The, the local control benefit um, you know, is meaningful as local pr progression can cause significant morbidity. Um, Similarly, the treatment-free interval, I think, is meaningful for these patients who have a limited lifespan. Um, and, and then lastly, there have been significant advances in systemic therapy since the time of the LAPO7 trial, and perhaps radiation has more of an impact in that setting. So we heard about these studies from Dr. Lacey um, in the talk just previous, but as we know, in metastatic patients, fulfirinox and gemcitabine um, with nab paclitaxel um, has significantly improved survival for patients with metastatic disease and, and is now increasingly used in the treatment of locally advanced disease. So the meta-analysis was mentioned, the median overall survival for patients with fulfirinox was uh, about two years. And similarly, in our Yale Phase II trial, um, upfront fulfirinox for locally advanced disease, the median overall, overall survival was just over two years. Um, so the theory is that with improved control of micrometastatic disease and distant progression with improved systemic regimens, that the addition of radiation is more likely to be of benefit. Um, technological advances, such as the increasing use of intensity modulated radiation, um, as well as the uh, emerging use of stereotactic um, body radiation therapy, um, also could uh, improve outcomes by reducing treatment-related toxicities and also allowing for escalation of dose delivered. So what is intensity modulated radiation? So this is radiation delivered with multiple beams or arcs. The intensity of the beam is varied across each treatment field, and it really allows the dose to be better conformed to the tumor target. So an example of a 3D conformal radiation plan, you're really delivering a square box of radiation around the tumor um, compared to an intensity modulated radiation plan where we can carve that dose away from bowel a little bit better. There was a retrospective study from Memorial Sun Kettering showing that the use of IMRT reduced um, grade two or higher GI toxicities in the treatment of locally advanced pancreatic cancer compared to 3D conformal plans. Um, and by limiting dose to neighboring normal tissues, specifically the small bowel and the stomach, IMRT um, does allow for safe escalation of dose delivered to the tumor. In contrast, stereotactic body radiation is the delivery of ablative doses of radiation, so larger doses per fraction in five or fewer fractions. Um, so unlike 3D conformal radiation or intensity modulated radiation, with SBRT, you're delivering a focal dose of radiation to the tumor volume with really a minimal margin of just two to three millimeters around the tumor target, and then a sharp fall off of the dose um, right outside of that. 
Um, in order to achieve this, we have to be very precise with where we're delivering the radiation. So it relies on managing the respiratory motion of the tumor um, during treatment. Um, so this is accounted for with four-dimensional planning CAT scans that show us how a tumor moves as, as the patient breathes. Um, and then techniques such as respiratory gating, where the treat, uh, treatment is delivered only in certain phases of the respiratory cycle, or devices um, like this abdominal compression device that can limit the motion of tumors with respiration. We also um, have our GI colleagues place fiducial markers into the tumor under EUS guidance. Um, and what this is useful for is on the day of treatment, we obtain a CAT scan on the treatment machine prior to each fraction. Um, and we're able to merge that to the planning CAT scan and then use the fiducial markers as surrogates in order to align the pancreas to where it was when we planned the treatment. Um, there have been multiple single institution um, studies looking at the efficacy and tolerability of stereotactic radiation for pancreatic cancer. So unlike lung cancer, where we've had very promising outcomes with local control over 90, 95 percent for early stage tumors, um, stereotactic radiation um, in the abdominal area for pancreatic tumors is much more complicated because of the proximity of normal bowel and the, um, the radiation tolerance of that surrounding normal bowel. So the initial studies for stereotactic radiation did show good local control of the tumor, but also um, a high rate of GI toxicities particularly um, duodenal ulcers. The results with fractionated SBRT have been uh, more promising, so delivering the treatment in three to five fractions um, is more protective to the bowel. So this is one multi-institutional prospective trial um, where patients with locally advanced disease received SBRT in five fractions. Um, so they're receiving fractions of 6.6 .6 gray per day, and in comparison, a standard plan would be 1.8 to 2 gray per day. Um, in five fractions after gemcitabine chemotherapy, their median survival was about 14 months, and the local control at one year was um, just under 80 percent. And I think more importantly, um, the toxicities were much lower than what we see with single fraction regimens. So we don't have any studies that have directly compared SBRT to conventionally fractionated chemoradiation, but the potential advantages include um, the possibility for an uh, increased biologic effect of delivering a larger fraction, which might in improve local control. Um, so if we compare across studies in the uh, single institution studies, approximately 80 percent local control reported at one year which is a little bit higher than what we're seeing in, say, the LAPO-7 trial when local control on the chemoradiation arms um, at one year was 68 uh, percent. There's also advantages to the shorter treatment time, so it means that less time off of uh, effective multi-agent systemic therapy, less delay to surgery for patients who might be operative candidates, um, and a shorter treatment program that is often better tolerated for patients. Um, and then there's also preliminary data suggesting that there might be an immune modulatory effect of SBRT that perhaps could be harnessed um, in conjunction with immune therapies. So if you look at clinicaltrials.gov, and I think I didn't restrict to the locally advanced patients, so I found 50 clinical trials currently evaluating stereotactic radiation um, in the management of pancreatic cancer, and one that was pointed out before, an important study that's randomizing patients um, to re uh, plus or minus SBRT after fulfirinox um, in the locally advanced setting. There are additional uh, technological advances that might allow for delivery of a more ablative dose um, of radiation um, with stereotactic techniques to pancreatic tumors, trying to uh, get the dose closer to what we would deliver with lung cancer. So one um, uh, advance is the development of these um, basically beacon transponders. So these are electromagnetic transponders that are placed um, under endoscopic uh, EUS guidance um, instead of fiducials, and then um, we can use these to actually track the motion of the tumor during treatment um, and pause treatment if the tumor target moves outside of the tolerance range. Um, and then another interesting development is this hydrogel that's been um, evaluated in preliminary studies. So it's used to try to separate the pancreatic head from the duodenum. Um, there was a, a cadaver study actually that was done that just showed the feasibility of placing this spacer under EUS guidance, achieving about a centimeter of space between the pancreatic head and the surrounding duodenum, and then they modeled SBRT plans on these post-hydrogel CT scans to prove that you are reducing the dose delivered to the duodenum with the spacer. So if this is feasible in patients, um, it would certainly um, increase the safety of, of delivering higher doses of radiation that might be more effective. And then finally, uh, preliminary data to show that there might be um, synergy between SBRT and immune therapies. So in cell lines, we, uh, th there's been shown an upregulation of PDL1 expression 
um, after radiation. And then mouse models of pancreatic tumors have shown, as you expect, a, a response with the tumor with, to radiation. No response to anti pdl one but the combination of anti pdl one and radiation showed a synergistic effect with enhanced tumor response. Um, and that was only to the larger SBRT-type um, fractions of radiation, but not smaller doses, um, and dependent on a CD8 um, T cell infiltration that happened after radiation. Um, so we're hoping to, to analyze uh, the similar things in a tissue co cohort that we're building from a uh, trial that's um, currently accruing. So the trial is actually restricted to patients with borderline resectable disease. Um, they're receiving um, eight cycles of fulferinox, and those without progression then um, go on to SBRT and hopefully surgery. The interesting thing is that we're banking tissue before and after fulferinox and before and after stereotactic radiation. Um, and hope to use that tissue in order to evaluate the immune modulatory effect of chemotherapy and stereotactic radiation on the tumor. Um, we're also um, obtaining EUS uh, measurements of elastography, which is a measure of tissue stiffness to see if that is a, a novel predictor of response to therapy, and then also circulating tumor DNA. Um, so in conclusion, our quick review of radiation for pancreatic cancer and resectable disease, we know adjuvant chemo is standard of care. We have an ongoing study that's evaluating the role of chemoradiation with more modern systemic therapies. In borderline resectable disease, um, neoadjuvant radiation or possibly SBRT um, may improve resectability. In locally advanced disease, we know that radiation provides a um, local control benefit if um, there is not progression on initial chemotherapy, and perhaps outcomes can be improved with dose escalation techniques such as stereotactic radiation. Um, and finally, there might be a role for radiation in combination with immune therapies. 